Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Tucky, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney magic. Whether they be singers, actors, Imagineers, animators, they have all made their mark on the Disney name. Be sure to check out the show notes, other episodes, contests, our social media pages from Facebook to Twitter, and more on our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. All guest opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guests, but they need no introduction. They can introduce themselves. Hi, this is uh, Richard Coleman, and I'm the Cheshire Cat from the Alice in Wonderland Adventures in Wonderland. <laughs> That reminds me of a story. It's Wesley Mann. I was the caterpillar on Adventures in Wonderland. You guys are so amazing. I'm so glad to have you guys on my new show. I I had Richard a couple years back. Finally, I got in touch with you, Wesley, and I was like, you know what? The two characters who really didn't talk too much on the show together are the caterpillar <laughs> no, that's and the I Cheshire Cat. We only had one scene that's... Didn't we, didn't we have a scene where I kind of floated near your head at one yeah, point or something? Yeah, I think there was only one because, you know, yeah. it, took, it took three people to be me and at least that many to be you, didn't it? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I had There was somebody doing the body and I was doing the mouth and somebody else did the head and then there was a guy doing the tail. Yes. And we're talking about Adventures in Wonderland, uh, a TV series that was on in the 90s, and originally it was filmed on the back lot at Disney's MGM Studios, now known as Disney's Hollywood Studios, and then it made its way to California. I think there were about 100 episodes in total, and it was a really big hit and amazing cast. It was like a, a deviation from what we originally saw in the animated film. Can you talk a little bit more about your audition? Yeah, I remember. I, I had like about four callbacks for it and they kept uh i think they they had me doing a british accent at one time and then they i think they probably had settled more with patrick and so they said they wanted me to do something other than a british accent and so i was i came in with other voices and it, it kept honing down and honing down but it was like maybe five callbacks or so and then we had to work i got an extra few hours to work with the animatronic you know the the servos, the triggers that operated the mouth, and, and you could really get elaborate with his lips and everything, you know, and uh, the cat's lips, and kind of coordinate that to make it look like, it was a little bit like a video game or, a, you know, some kind of, uh, it was, you know, eye and hand and uh, uh, eye and hand coordination kind of a thing. So I felt pretty good with that, and then I came in and did the audition, and it was network and they had the little, you know, head there and everything, and the servo was sticking, and so I really wasn't in sync so much with what I had been doing. And I could, I looked up, and, and Andy, the the producer, was so the executive producer. She was so she looked disappointed, and she was like, "Okay, thank thank you, Richard, for coming in." <laughs> and I sat there and I said, "I'm going to do this again," <laughs> and I've never really done that before. I've never really said, I'm going to do this again. And I don't think they were used to it either. And they all went, um, okay, you know, so, um, (laughs) and I just, I just compensated, just kind of shot from the hip and compensated with this sticking servo and, uh, and did it, nailed it. That was my big cliffhanger audition for it. Wow. What about you, Wes? Well, um, my agent called me and said, well, they need, to, uh, they need a Mad Hatter for this uh, new Disney series. And so I was like, oh, great. I'd love to play the Mad Hatter. I'll just go in and audition for the Mad Hatter. And so uh, <laughs> I did my Mad Hatter audition. And I thought it went pretty well. And they laughed, et cetera. And apparently they liked it so much that they'd rather see me for the Caterpillar. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Then came, like Richard said, there was like a callback and another callback, and then there was a, a makeup test, and then there's, and of course, there's all the rigmarole of making a deal and, you know, wondering if your life is going to change radically or whether it's just going to all, you know, evaporate. Um, and then 
then by the time it got to around to the screen test, I, don't know if you, I think you were in on this, Richard, where they did a screen test over at uh, Hollywood Center Studios, and they put me in makeup, uh, and, uh, you know, we were there for like a really long time. Well, my agent actually told me, they want to test you, but you're the only guy for the Caterpillar right now. So it's kind of a done deal. If you, if you want this, you can, you can do it. I'm like, yeah, great, I'm on. Um, unfortunately, I had to back out of a play that I was I was cast in in San Francisco oh. at the time. Um, oh, but it was shit. like, but this is a series for the Disney Channel, so I have to do it. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, then there was a long period of okay, we're on retainer, and we were all sort of like ready to go. It, like the audition process was like, if I'm not mistaken, a little over a year. And then we started in wow. you know, Orlando in October. Yeah. There was yeah. a lot going on in Orlando at that time because a lot of movie stars were coming in, like Audrey Hepburn and Betty White and Bette Midler. Just a lot of uh, amazing talent because the park had just opened. And I, I can't even imagine, did you guys like run into movie stars all the time <laughs> while you were working there? You know, I think we figured that we were such big stars that every other star just sort of disappeared in the firmament. Um, frankly, <laughs> I only spent two days a week on the lot. It was such a big deal to get me in and out of makeup. And I had so much time on my hands that I hung out in the makeup uh, room and learned how to um, make eyebrows and beards and wig fronts. And um, I subsequently made a wig front for a show that Rick uh, Richard directed, as a matter of fact. That's right. We had two studios, from what I remember, there were two studios filled with Wonderland setups, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, and there was a tube, a big plastic tube that people would walk through on a tour. That's and right. And they would look down at us. I mean, I remember just walking around the set like it was a park because it was those mm-hmm. little pathways that would go over a bridge and a little pond. And then there was Hatter's House and, and then there was, you know, the Queens. And it was just, you, you could just pretty much walk. It was different when it was in Hollywood. It was more broken up yeah. but in florida it was it was really like entering a, a fantasy world and you just walk around and the makeup yeah. process was just very difficult for you because first of all well, getting in and out of the costume the costume is huge yeah. and you have two other individuals underneath you who are playing your extra hands yeah. and then you yeah. have to, and then you have to really insert you into the costume if you have not seen wesley in this costume just google it say wesley man caterpillar uh because it's just <laughs> extraordinary the costumes that they would give uh, the entire cast are just amazing and the makeup team they they knew what they were doing so how long overall would it take to finally get into that outfit with full makeup and then shooting a scene? Oftentimes, uh, the call would be 4.30 in the morning because oh, Ron, Ron Wilde and Karen had to do all the characters one after another. So my particular makeup, the first time he did it, like in the early episodes, it would take four hours until uh, later on he... Um, he had all of his colors mixed because a lot of it was airbrushing and um, these uh, latex appliances to build out my forehead and my um, cheeks to make the, make it all uh, blend down into the headpiece. So initially it took about four hours to, to put on and then about an hour and a half to remove because the, um, the latex and the, well, it's a little technical, but it's called Pax paint. It's paint and it's pigment and um, and uh, latex in one solution. So it helps the pieces blend together amazingly well. Well, that mm. takes a surgical uh, 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 solvent called detachol in order to remove. As we got further into the series, it took about two, two and a half hours to do my makeup and then an hour and a half to take off. The actual loading into the suit didn't take that long. It probably took about 20 to 30 minutes from the time um, John Lovelady, you know, sat down as the lower <laughs> set of hands. And I can't remember the guy who was the second set of hands. And then I loaded in the back. Um, it all mm. sort of came together, you know, in about a half hour. Well, I had to, I had to watch the scenes and I would give that, like if the cow was in a scene, I would have to be there just off camera to say my lines and uh, so there was no puppet involved, but it was just me doing voiceover to get their timing. And then I would also 
go to the um, ADR room with um, with uh, uh, Andy Copley, and then we would uh, do the final track of, of of what my voice was for the previous episodes. That would be recorded separately. So there were like when we would shoot, it would be a, a like a production track, but it wouldn't be the final thing. So I was like, I did a lot of time was in the studio. I got to be pretty good at it um, in that you put on the headphones and they have these five beeps go off in your ear and then you sync your words with the lips that are already on the final film. And it was fun. It was really, um, uh, I don't know, it wasn't like necessarily creative because you kind of had to match it, but you got to know your own timing and uh, you really got to, I don't know, it just kind of, it was it was a nice satisfying final uh, effort um, for that. And then on Fridays in the evening, everybody usually had Friday afternoons off, and that's when they would do the cat, and we'd all just kind of hunker down on his one little location because we would just film him no matter if he was going to be indoors or outdoors or at the Hatters or at the Queens or in the forest or something like that. It was always just hanging in the same place in the studio with a green screen behind it, and it could go anywhere. And then, the, you know, and it was just a matter of coordinating it's still funny. It's just such a funny, little funny thing, and and I'm so glad that we did it. You know? Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> and you had plenty of guest stars on the show. You know, Terry Gar would come oh, in yeah. once in a while, be the Duchess. Ken Page would come in and be the Walrus. Fantastic. Willie Nelson and, and cute Marley Matlin as played a bunny. Yeah. Uh, who was hearing impaired? I, I loved, you know, the easygoing nature of um, Willie Nelson. He signed yeah. my LP of Stardust for me, and I still have oh. it. And, oh, that's uh, cool. And he still has that guitar that he had back then, and the hole in it just gets bigger and bigger. And he had he had um, someone who was assigned to just be the guitar wrangler because that was his prized possession. And so wow. there was someone who was assigned to just just keep track of his guitar. So those two were pretty awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I mean, I remember, you know, I remember Marley Matlin being very sweet and nice and, you know, you could easily be just starstruck around these people. And Terry Garr was just delightful and sweet. I will say this. It is such a gift to have a place to go to work every day with the same people who know you, respect you, and help you do what you do. It's so fantastic. And to be able to do that for 100 episodes was a gift that I didn't realize so much at that time in my life, but I certainly realize what a gift it is now. Um, yeah, and I do. It's really true. Uh, yeah, I do miss those people, but you know, in this day and age, on Facebook, I still talk to Tish, our makeup person, and um, um, you know, certainly the cast. We we're all in touch. You know, like you are in a, in mm-hmm. a busy in a busy mid career world. Um, yeah, but I I do I do miss it. Um, it was uh, it was arduous, uh, but it was also such a gift. And uh, I mean, it was like I remember when my agent said, "Come on in, I got to talk to you." And I came in, and she said, "They want you for this series, and you're going to move to Florida." And I was like, "Holy cow, this is going to be great!" I mean, and I had like I think I'd broken up with somebody or something. I was like completely free and. And I was like, so it was just a a delightful experience from the word go and friends would come to visit and and Disney put us up in this really nice condo. So it was great. It was a great social thing. But, you know, John, John Hoffman directed a movie called um, Good Boy. I think it was with. uh, Yeah. Yeah. It was like it was like a dog from outer space or something like that. And he, you know, he called me in and I was able to do a few days and, you know, doing voice work and stuff and. And it was just, it was, he was very generous and uh, we've had dinner over at his place, like, you know, half a dozen times. Sometimes he didn't even there. We just break in, we just eat whatever's <laughs> in the fridge and everyone was so talented and, and he just felt like part of a real, you know, it was like, you know, just teamwork or, or just like an acting ensemble, a company. And we'd come in and do these, do these stories. It was just, uh. It's rare. It's rare that it happens. And, and in our case, you know, we had the added responsibility of, you know, being being in kids' lives. Like, right yeah, now, definitely. Oh, I'm running God, into, yeah. uh, to 20 and 30-year-old people who are like, oh, my God, you're the caterpillar. I watched you every day. 
So yeah, that's really that's true. Really special too. You know, the show was so loved, and um, you know, I was a big fan of Bob Keeshan, you know, Captain Kangaroo when I was growing up, and so it's kind of nice to think that we were we were yeah. some of that. For a generation, you know. And I cannot thank you guys enough for coming on the show. Uh, I want to make sure I give the opportunity if you guys are doing anything in coming months or appearing in any movies. Well, you know, oh, wow, something, yeah. something Disney related. Um, I did an episode of Live and Maddie uh, uh, last month. And incidentally, mm-hmm. the, the, the assistant, uh, the first AD walks up to me and says, you know, you don't remember me. But we've worked <laughs> together. And I said, I said, you know what? I remember you. I just don't remember your name. He says, I'm Dave Coe. I was the second AD in Orlando. Uh, oh, in wow. Wonderland. And so it was so awesome to see him again. And, uh, you know, had a, great, had a great week on <laughs> Live and Live and Maddie. And, you know, it's a good show, great set, and good fun. So For This callback that I had today, I actually had to sign a non disclosure agreement, <laughs> Mr. Commercial. Um, and I'll be directing, uh, I do a lot of directing of plays up in uh, Ventura and Ojai, and I'll be directing uh, Waiting for Godot, actually, this um, uh, March. And you uh, with, didn't uh, call me. And you didn't uh, call me. See? What, what, see? what am I supposed to do? I, don't know. I can't afford you, uh, uh, oh, Beth. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. You know, you're just an expensive, you know, oh, you're completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then in the fall, I'm going to direct uh, two plays. One is uh, Catch-22. Most, most people didn't even know it was a play, but it, uh, Joseph Heller's Catch-22. That's what I'm going to be doing. This is such a treat to have you on the show now, both of you, and getting to talk. Oh, so, you well, know, Thanks, Tammy. That's so nice. I, I love that you put this together. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And, you know, before we end, I have three Disney questions I always ask my guests before we end, and they're called the Fab Three. Here is the Donald question. And, Richard, you can go first if you'd like, and Wesley, you can follow. Uh, oh, the, good. Okay. <laughs> the Donald question is, <laughs> as a child, what Disney film – was one of your favorites to see on the big screen. Easily. Sword in the Stone. I, 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 I've seen it since then, and I was like, well, it's good, but I wonder what... And I think I was just such a fan of um, Sir King Arthur, all of that stuff. Being that I am still a child, um, my, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite Disney picture by far is The Incredibles. But oh, yeah. um, when I was very little, uh, the very first one that I saw on the big screen was Dumbo, and I loved it. And our goofy question, what Disney character, besides the ones in Wonderland, do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Oh, um, <laughs> I would have to go with uh, Maleficent. I, uh, she I think she's best. sexy, and I'd have to, I would just work my best charms to win her over. Because I would love to have a powerful friend like that. I think that my best friend would be Emma, the designer in um, The Incredibles, who designs the suit. (laughs) Because we could talk about fashion endlessly and about the function (laughs) and form of uh, suits and the lack of capes. Oh, she's a great character. I'm changing mine. I'm changing mine too. Um, you know what? I walk around when when anything goes well. I say, "Go fight, win!" And I lift my arms up in the air. And our Mickey question: If I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? Um, well, it's a song, but there's no lyrics to it. But I like the um, I like the Sorcerer's Apprentice music. I like that when when Mickey's trying to. Uh, you know, stop all the brooms from replicating in the room, and and he's you know he's the sorcerer's apprentice, and it's like didn't did it didn't did it did it. I just love that. I was in a play recently, and I played ukulele on "When You Wish Upon a Star," and oh. that that that's it. That's quint- quintessential Disney to me. I mean, the, the, it doesn't get any different than, or any better than that. You know. Well, thank you both for coming on the show, and I think I should give the last words to the Cheshire Cat and Caterpillar, to their fans. So, Cheshire Cat, would you like to start first, and Caterpillar, would you like to follow? Oh, I loved being in the show. I loved it all. And you can find me in the villain section in Disneyland. I'm one of the Disney villains. Don't ever forget it. I'm one of the worst guys you can run into. (laughs) And that's the end of the story. (laughs) 
Adventures in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs>